What connects Fritz Haber, a Nobel Prize winning German chemist, and Cicero, the famous orator, philosopher, and politician from ancient Rome? Would it blow your mind if I told you that the connection is Channa? Fritz Haber, along with Karl Bosch, developed something called the Haber-Bosch process, which enabled the industrial conversion of nitrogen in our atmosphere to ammonia. This one invention is considered to have had the single greatest impact on human population since the dawn of humanity. It turns out that the production of ammonia is what enabled us to make synthetic fertilizers. And thanks to that, the world's population exploded from 1.6 billion in 1900 to 8 billion in 2023, with two world wars in between. You see, what fertilizers do is make nitrogen available to plants. And without nitrogen, plants cannot make amino acids. And without amino acids, no protein, and proteins are the building block of life. And atmospheric nitrogen cannot be used directly because it has a very strong triple bond that makes it very unreactive. So how did humans do agriculture before Fritz Haber? We can thank Chana and every other dal, pulse, legume, because this is one of the few families of plants whose roots have built a symbiotic relationship with a family of bacteria called rhizobia that take nitrogen from the air and convert it to ammonia using an enzyme that only they can produce, nitrogenase. The plant provides the bacteria with sugars made by photosynthesis and the bacteria make ammonia, which the plant uses to make amino acids and thus protein. Now you know why chana and all dals in general have a lot more protein than other plant-based foods. So before synthetic fertilizers, farmers had to grow legumes like dal, chana, rajma in between growing rice or wheat because cereal grains would just wipe the soil of nitrogen. So when you grow dal, it replenishes the nitrogen in the soil. So what's the connection to Cicero, the famous ancient Roman politician, you might wonder? He is named after the word Cicer, which in Latin means chickpea or chana. And that's not the only thing. The Roman political family Piso is named after Pisum, meaning peace. The family Lentulus is named after Lentil, Masur Dal. And the family Fabius is named after Faba, Latin for beans. Crop rotation with legumes was so important to ancient Rome that many of its most important families were literally named after pulses. By this point, some of you probably have this one doubt. What is the difference between these four words that I seem to use interchangeably? Dal, pulse, legume, and lentil. Let's start with the largest category, legume. Legumes are the plants whose seeds form in pods like peas, chana, rajma. And they have the symbiotic relationship that we just spoke about with soil bacteria that convert atmospheric nitrogen to ammonia. And within that, pulses are legumes that humans have specifically cultivated as food. If you live in Bengaluru or Chennai, you would have seen the flame of the forest, gul mohar, beautiful orange red flowers and large seed pods. Also a legume, but not consumed as food. And oh, peanuts. They are legumes and are consumed as food, but are not considered pulses because of their high fat content. Here's a list of the most common pulses. Dal is the generic term used for pulses as well as the liquid dish made using the pulses. It could be whole, split, dried or fresh pulses that are used to make dal. And finally, the most confusing term, lentil. Technically speaking, lentil only refers to masoor dal, whose botanical name is Lens culinaris, and that is because of the shape of the split dal, like a lens. But it is not uncommon for lentils to be used to describe split tur and moong dal as well. So why are pulses important? Dals are packed with nutrients and have a relatively high protein content, making them an ideal source of protein particularly in regions where meat, eggs, and dairy are not economically 
are culturally accessible. And since farmers need to grow them in rotation to replenish soil nitrogen anyway, they have become a key component of diets in many cultures. Dals are low in fat and rich in soluble fiber, which can lower blood cholesterol and also help with the control of blood sugar. For anyone with diabetes and heart conditions, dals are fantastic. They've also been shown to help combat obesity. And farmers using pulses for crop rotation improves farm and soil biodiversity while keeping harmful pests and diseases at bay. Pulses also contribute to mitigating the effects of climate change by reducing the dependence on synthetic fertilizers used to add nitrogen artificially into the soil. A huge amount of greenhouse gases are released in the manufacturing and application of these fertilizers and their overuse is bad for the environment. And in some cases, pulses also free soil bound phosphorus, thus significantly decreasing the need for fertilizers. Let's now look at the general nutritional profile of dals. While the individual nutrient composition varies across dals, generally speaking, they provide, in addition to carbohydrates, which still makes up most of its nutrients, a good amount of protein, folate, soluble and insoluble fiber, iron, phosphorus and a small amount of polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fatty acids including linoleic and oleic acid. Dals contain approximately 21 to 25 percent protein but have smaller amounts of essential amino acids such as methionine, tryptophan and cysteine. The protein content and amino acid composition of dals varies with the kind of dal, germination status, environment and application of fertilizers. You also have to keep in mind that these numbers are for the raw seeds and not the cooked dal, which has a lot more water. As I explained in my detailed video on protein, you can look at dals in three tiers in terms of overall protein quality. Soy, chana and black urad at the top, green gram, which is moong, masoor and tur dal in the middle and ragda, peas at the bottom. However, dals are usually not complete proteins. This is why most cultures around the world consume grains and legumes in combination. For example, lysine is low in rice but high in dals and tryptophan is high in rice but low in dals. So dal chawal or rajma chawal is complete protein. But remember, it's also a lot of carbohydrates, so keep that in mind. So before we cook our dal, we need to soak it. So why do we soak dals before cooking? If you want to make rajma chawal or chole tomorrow, soak them tonight. Want to make dal tadka for lunch, soak the dal before breakfast. Want to make hummus for dinner, soak the chana for a few hours before boiling and mashing. Pulses are usually dry ingredients with minimal moisture and water activity, which is why they don't spoil while sitting in your shelf. Trying to cook the unsoaked dal will require a large amount of not just time, but also cooking fuel. Soaking them makes water penetrate all the layers of the dal. So now when they're cooked, the water inside the dal will heat up and in the process, every kernel of the dal gets cooked more evenly and quickly. Imagine a sponge. Soaking a sponge causes moisture to penetrate. Now, if you had to put a drop of ink on one corner of the dry sponge, it will remain concentrated there. It won't spread across the sponge. But if you have a soaked sponge and then put a drop of ink, it will spread over a much larger area, much quicker. Instead of the ink, consider heat. Instead of the sponge, consider dal. The physics is still the same. Besides speeding up cooking, soaking serves another critical function, removing anti-nutrient factors. Plants, as a general rule, don't want to be eaten. Pulses, like many other plant-based foods, naturally contain some molecules which make certain components of the dals difficult to digest for the human body. These include protease, lipase and amylase inhibitors, saponins and oxalates, etc. Some of these inhibit the action of the enzymes our bodies produce to digest our food. This is the plant's way of a losing army planting rebel spice inside our bodies. But when the dals are soaked, a large part of these dissolve in the soaking water, which you must discard before cooking. Soaked pulses will still have some anti-nutrient factors, but significantly less than those 
in unsoaked pulses. The remaining anti-nutrient factors will get deactivated by cooking, which is why we never consume raw or partially cooked dals. Another key factor here is whether we eat the dal whole or split. While the whole sabut dal contains a lot more micronutrients and fiber, it also contains more anti-nutrients and for some people is very hard to digest. Often a good compromise is to eat the partially split or chilke wali dal. You can also reduce anti-nutrients by letting the whole dals sprout. By letting them sit in moist conditions, you are telling the seed, time to let your baby grow. And that in turn starts a series of chemical reactions that reduce these anti-nutrient factors and also make the seed more digestible. Now that you have soaked or perhaps sprouted the dal, let's start cooking it. Should you use an open pot? or a pressure cooker. Social media influencers will tell you two things. One, that open pot cooking retains more nutrients. Two, you have the opportunity to remove the deadly poisonous foam that surfaces when cooking dal. As with most things about food influencers on social media, they are wrong on both counts. Pressure cooking actually results in more easily digestible dal than open pot cooked dal. Two, the foam, as I've explained in one of my earlier videos, is really mostly loose starch and protein and some saponins, which in small amounts are actually healthy for you. So you don't need to remove this foam. When pressure cooking, this foam can clog up the safety valve. So add half a teaspoon of any oil and that will prevent this froth. Finally, let's look at some food science tips. When should you add salt? If you add salt before cooking the dal, the salt will pull water out of the dal. You lose the benefits of soaking. The dal will also take a longer time to cook and sometimes not cook fully at all. So always add salt after the dal has cooked. Let's say you have some really old channa or rajma sitting in your shelf. Pulses tend to lose moisture over time and thus become really hard to cook. This is when we unleash the most multi-talented magician of the kitchen, baking soda. A quarter teaspoon of baking soda when cooking any dal, chana or rajma will ensure maximum softness because alkaline conditions prevent pectin in plant cell walls from setting into a hard gel. Baking soda does not destroy any nutrients, so relax. And when you're cooking chana, you can also add a tea bag and it has two effects. It stains the chana into an appetizing dark brown color and the acids in the tea also neutralizes the baking soda after it's done its job. And my favorite one, black urad, vigna mungo, produces a thick mucilage when slow cooked. This is why in rural Punjab, this dal is just cooked overnight in the residual heat of tandoors or embers of firewood. And that mucilage is what gives it that thick and creamy, almost buttery texture, not the addition of large quantities of actual butter. So the makhani in actual dal makhani is from the dal, not makhani.